You're welcome back after a short break. The second speaker for the day is Father Maria Charles. It's my privilege to introduce you all to Father. Father is a Catholic priest from Tamil Nadu. He is a member of the religious order of Celsians of Don Bosco. At present, Father is working as secretary for the Office for Education and Culture, Catholic. Presently, he is working as the Secretary for the Office of Education and Culture, Catholics Bishop, Conference of India, CBCI. Prior to this, he was the Director of Don Bosco Youth Animation South Asia and Executive Secretary of All India Don Bosco Education Society for 12 years. He has Masters both in Social Work and Mass Media and Journalism and holds a doctorate in development communication from Celsius University in Rome. He had taught communication in Tokyo and has presented papers in national and international seminars in US, Philippines, Italy, Spain, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. He has also been the editor for two magazines and founder publisher of Arambu publication for 11 years and has published over 85 books. He has authored five books and edited over 11 books on youth education and youth rights related issues. He has organized many national and international conferences, symposiums and consultations. Father, we are honored to have you as the speaker for the day. The NEP, which was approved by Union Cabinet of India on 29th July this year, outlines the vision of India's new education system. The NEP replaces the previous National Policy on Education 1986. But to sow the seed of this policy, some major tilling of soil is important. Some of the changes will be unanimously accepted, while some may have problems being implemented. To have a critical analysis, I request the most venerable Father Maria Charles to share his views on the topic, a critical outlook on NEP, the concerns of Catholic institutions and the challenges in the implementation of the policy. Over to you, Father. Father? Father, can you hear me? Father Maria? Maybe he got this connect. Mm -hmm. I think father has got disconnected. Uh, okay. He's come, he's come. Yes, father. Yeah, just give me a second, just one second. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, father. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yes, Father. Yes, we can father. hear okay, you. Now. Sorry, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, sorry, I low. just got. The voice yeah. is a little low. 
I'm making, I'm making, I'm making the number one part. Is it okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, Father. All right. So, Your Grace, uh, good morning. And uh, to all the fathers, brothers, sisters, and teachers, uh, good morning to all of you. And uh, oh, sorry, I missed the introduction because he just, uh, the net went off here. Okay. So, I'm sure uh, Ms. Priyanka must have said something good about me. Okay. So, no, 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 no. Just, okay. just kidding. So, thank you very much, dear participants. Uh, as you know, I'm working at the CBCI Office for Education and Culture. So in the past uh, two months, we have been discussing a lot about this National Education Policy 2020. And I have had the opportunity to participate as well as address quite a few conferences. And uh, the result of it is uh, a few reflections and a few uh, important points that I would like to share with you. Is it okay that I share the screen with you all? Mm -hmm. The National Education Policy 2020, I just want to have a closer look at this. OK, a closer look at this policy and. Uh, as you uh, yesterday, I'm sure for the John Ravi must have presented the uh, National Education Policy 2020 and he must have also given a lot of highlights, but uh, it is good to listen to from another perspective as well, because the policy itself is a very uh, a comprehensive one and uh, people can understand a uh, little differently from each other. And uh, let me go. Some of the expected outcomes that uh, the government, especially the policy makers are claiming are <clears throat> the universalization of access and uh, ensuring equity and inclusion and bringing back two crores of uh, children who are already out of school. They want to bring into the system. 100% gross enrollment ratio, GER, in preschool to secondary school by 2030. Focus on 21st century skills in teaching, learning, and assessment. And they want every child to come out of school adept at, le at least with one skill. And resource sharing pool complexes. Some of these are new and uh, some of these uh, seem innovative, but let's go closer and closer. <clears throat> The positive elements of uh, NEP 2020 are the overall choice of subjects through multidisciplinary learning and, uh, across schools and higher education. And uh, quite a few are uh, welcoming this because uh, the children never had much of choice uh, in the school. They just had to study just one subject. And uh, even if they choose a stream, they did not have much choice of other streams. But uh, the present uh, NEP 2020 uh, promises to change all that. So even if a, a child or a boy is choosing science stream, he can also take a subject from art stream, things like that. Much needed reforms in curriculum, pedagogy and assessment are emphasized. The teacher's competences are at the center of the proposed fundamental reforms. But what, has, what is going to be done for this? The government is proposing a few schemes. In schools, deep learning through application, early introduction to coding, vocational education, focus on learning outcomes and ongoing assessment. These are the few things that uh, the policy is promising. And uh, about the school education, you know that we had uh, 10 plus 2 uh, and the government, the new policy is changing that. Focus on overall in curriculum, reformed uh, board exams, reduction in the syllabus, and a thrust on experiential learning and critical thinking. Unlike the present uniform of uh, 10 plus 2, they would like to introduce 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. I'm sure you are aware of all these things. Just uh, emphasize emphasis on teaching students up to class 5 in their mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Much stress is given on early child care and education, what they call ECCE, by advocating foundational literacy and numeracy uh, in higher education, four years under graduation, 
a multi-entry and multi-exit in colleges, facilitating the entry of top 100 uh, foreign universities, single regulatory and support system, single regulator and supports private-public partnership, PPP, in higher education. They are promised 6% of GDP spending in education, which was thought of from 1966, but uh, came into existence uh, with a new policy at the time, 1968. We will see about that a little later. And a uh, few takeaways from the school education, as this policy is promising. The school system commences at the age of three. Most parents may not be willing to send their children so early to school, but uh, uh, several places the parents may have to accompany them. You know, Additionally, starting school at age three may negatively affect the childhood, they say. But uh, there are also a lot of um, educationists who, who say that children learn at uh, children learn well, especially languages and all that at a very early age. And it is good to give them a systematic education uh, very early on. So there are two groups of thoughts about it. The NEP 2020 lays emphasis on universal access to school for all children in the next decade. It stresses on increasing the gross enrollment ratio, GER, as I told you earlier. So this is one of the promises that they are making. Okay. But then we already had a right to education act 2009. You must have been very, you are very much aware of it. And it brought uh, quite a few millions of students back to the schools. Uh, but that was from the age group of 6 to 14. So this is from 3 to 18. Two crore children will be brought back to mainstream, it says. And the plan to provide breakfast along with midday meal for government school children. Now, these are some of the takeaways uh, generally that we find in the national education policy. But a few uh, takeaways for the higher education. Uh, <clears throat> what are the major recommendations of the NEP in higher education? Replacing the UGC and the IITs, ASTE with the Higher Education Commission of India. <clears throat> Opening up Indian higher education to foreign players. Reintroduction of the four-year multidisciplinary bachelor's program with uh, exit options. Flexibility to institutions to offer different designs for master's programs. Discontinuation of the MPhil program. Setting up of a national research foundation. <clears throat> and there are four agencies. Okay. Now, the umbrella body for higher education will be the, the Higher Education Commission of India. Okay. So that will be the umbrella body under which there will be four uh, local bodies. I mean, uh, uh, there are four uh, four bodies. One is the NHERC. <coughs> I'm sorry, one second. <coughs> the National Higher Education Regulatory Council. Then there is a National Accreditation Council, NAC, which was there. And the Higher Education Grant Council, HEGC, will be there. General Education Council, GEZ. And of course, the overreaching autonomous umbrella body named the Higher Education Commission of India. So the UGC will be done away with and uh, the Higher Commission of India will take place, take its place. Now, will this create a confusion and overlapping of administrative authority? These are things we have to wait and see. But uh, we can, as we can see, there are going to be not four bodies and one umbrella body. So instead of one body, we are going to have so many. And you can understand the overlapping of it or the confusion that it could create. The NEP also talks about granting uh, graded autonomy to colleges. Okay. And before that, uh, it set it itself a tall, tall task of increasing the GR in higher education from 26.3% to 50%. A few states have already uh, achieved this 50% uh, enrollment, and uh, many others are far behind. OK, so the government has set GER up to 50% in 2035. Emphasis has been on providing a flexible curriculum through an interdisciplinary approach, creating multiple exit points in what would be a four year undergraduate program. Okay. The NEP also talks about granting graded autonomy to colleges in a move that will phase out affiliation of colleges to universities in the next 15 years. They want each of the colleges to be autonomous and uh, uh, probably uh, most of these colleges, I don't know if they will be funded or they will have to look for uh, like the private universities of these days. Uh, they have to look for their own funds. We'll have to see. 
but the credit autonomy given to the college will make each of these colleges uh, like an university which means the smaller colleges and the weaker colleges we may have to be closing it down and they will be coming out with uh, a minimum number of students like a 2000 or something like that it is not mentioned in this policy but it was mentioned in the 2019 draft that uh, any uh, college with lesser than 2000 students uh, may have to join the other bigger colleges in the district so as far as teaching is concerned a new national curriculum framework for teacher education the ncfte will be framed by 2021 the ba degree is likely to become a four year integrated course by 2030 so we may have to rethink about our ba colleges and they will have to be integrated with the degree college so go, so they are, but they do give us some time in order to restructure all these things so there are four aspects to a teacher education one teacher education will be moved by 2030 into a multidisciplinary colleges and universities so it won't be a separate b.ed college a two-year integrated b.ed minimum degree qualification for teaching <clears throat> that includes student teaching at uh, local schools by 2030 and there is also two-year B.Ed. Uh, for applicants with an existing bachelor's degree in the other sub specialized subjects, which means uh, after the degree, you can take two-year B.Ed. And uh, one-year B.Ed. for those who have completed the equivalent of a four-year multidisciplinary bachelor's degree or has obtained a master's degree in a specialty. So they can be allowed to do one-year B.Ed. So these are the four types of uh, teacher education program that the NEP is given. And then, uh, in the higher education, there are a few other highlights. With multiple exit system, is higher education helping the poor? Is a very important question. But uh, as you know, this uh, national education policy is following the system of many of the universities in the West, uh, especially that of America and a few other places. And uh, those of us who have studied abroad or in Europe or in America for a few years would know that uh, this system is following many of those uh, things that exist there. And the public investment, uh, as we told about 6%, gross enrollment ratio also we have seen, graded autonomy we have seen, phasing out application system in 15 years. So the education that we have had 12 years until now will be changed to 15 years. So online self-disclosure based transparent system and approvals in place of inspections. So which means uh, leading to, as I told you about the assessment program, common norms for public and private higher education institutions. So special education zone for disadvantaged region and the establishment of national research foundation. So this is one big move and they are going to also spend a lot of money on this NRF. And uh, the slogan that is coming out of this uh, uh, national education policy on higher education is flexibility, choice and experimentation. So they want to introduce uh, more and more digitalization. And uh, they also want to bring in National Educational Tech Forum, what they call NETF, an autonomous body, which will also be created to encourage the use of technology in college education. There will be a digital repository, online courses, digital depository, the repositories. Student service uh, towards making this reality will likely be developed. I don't know these things. These are things that they are planning, but it will take a few years to establish. But given the fact that uh, the students are very much interested in uh, digital technology, probably some of these things may even find uh, a quick um, a play. Uh, sorry, improvement. Uh, uh, in especially in establishing this. Critical thinking and free inquiry is also emphasized uh, in this document, but universities are being intimidated, as we know, into political and cultural conformity. Uh, in the last few years, you must have seen also how uh, <coughs> uh, there was a lot of problem with uh, DU and JNU and, and many other colleges and universities. So how much of critical thinking and free inquiry will be really allowed is a question that we have to ask. Given the fact that NEP 2020, a comprehensive policy document has been introduced during pandemic and lockdowns, makes it challenging to continue the debates 
that would help the policy to be widely understood by a broader community. So it's not very surprising that this government had uh, brought it out before the parliament even came uh, in session because uh, they probably expected a lot of opposition and that is why the cabinet approved it and they <coughs> brought it out into the public. By bypassing the voice of the parliament and getting the NEP 2020 passed by cabinet not, well, is absolutely not the right thing to do in a democratic setup, certainly. There are no concrete mechanisms to implement this policy as of now, and it is totally lacking in funding clarity because this, uh, this policy is very ambitious and very idealistic, and uh, you can call it also visionary and uh, very progressive, but, uh, but uh, it calls for a very many number of uh, commissions and committees and establishment of a lot of infrastructure and uh, qualification of uh, lakhs and lakhs of teachers and uh, establishing so many mechanisms. And where, do, where will they find the funds? That's another question. Education is a concurrent subject both under the state and center. We will see about this a little later. <clears throat> and uh, one of the few challenges that uh, that opens for us and opens for the schooling all over India is the privatization of schools. Totally almost half of India's children, 47.5% of the children are in private schools already. <clears throat> with uh, 12 crore children, making it the third largest in the world. So when did it all began? You know that it had begun after the uh, 1990s, when the World Bank was trying to get India out of the Forex uh, crisis. One of the conditions that uh, they laid to India was that uh, public money should not be spent too much on the public education as well as public health. You know. That is how the government started spending less and less on government uh, schools and government uh, hospitals. And uh, that led to the mushrooming of the private schools and private colleges in India. And uh, in the in the after the 2000, after the 2000, uh, this only increased more and more. This only increased more and more because the government was not spending really as it should have done. Uh, what you call quite a, quite a few percentages of the GDP on uh, the public education, but it did not. So what was the result? About 47.5% of the students moved to the private school system. Okay. So another problem that we have is lack of teacher training. There is no plan to improve upon the 80 lakhs teachers already available in the system, and there are many untrained teachers. Would you believe if I were to tell you that over 11 lakhs of teachers are untrained, unqualified in India, and they receive, uh, they are called as para teachers or guest teachers, and they work mainly in pre primary and in Anganwadi and in government aided schools, also in uh, private schools uh, in, the, in rural areas, but there are many, many untrained teachers. And they receive an honorarium. They are not receiving salaries, but they receive an honorarium. And uh, I, you, it is uh, comparatively less, lesser than what the teachers get. But then this type of uh, teacher training, uh, what I call teachers, talking about, uh, we are talking about 11 lakhs teachers already into the system. And if this new education policy is planning to start schooling from the age of three, we are talking about another 10 to 11 lakhs of teachers coming into the system. So a system in which more than 20 to 22 lakhs of teachers who are unqualified and untrained coming inside, uh, how will the education system improve in India? The next challenge is, uh, is the NPST the solution. The NEP seeks to do away with the problem, make teacher recruitment transparent by setting up a national common National Professional Standards uh, for Teachers, NPST. They say this will be developed by uh, the National Council for Teacher Education by 2022. Well, uh, while this uh, National Professional Standards for Teachers uh, is there, it is, uh, it is uh, talking about the recruitment, <clears throat> but it doesn't talk about already sister teachers who are in the system. 
in the system and uh, other other few challenges are the policy has not given sufficient consideration to many already existing problems in the education system for example issues related to government school teachers lack of infrastructure washroom library playground so many things are lacking in an ordinary school government aided school or a government school in many states less than 10% of the teachers pass the teachers eligibility test you know when the tet was held how many teachers passed so that was another big problem you know so many teachers were not eligible according to the tet tet as per acer report 2019 less than half the students in class 5 could read a paragraph or do a max sum from a class 2 text so imagine Uh, so this is the situation that we have in india okay so by just including students uh, putting the students into the school system but really not uh, teaching them well so this has created a huge divide between the well run private schools and uh, the badly run government schools or uh, government sponsored schools now india's children ranked 73rd out of 74 countries in the international pisa test of reading science and arithmetic okay so imagine we are just 73rd out of 74 countries when it came to uh, pisa test so our education system is uh, very 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 uh, in the uh, very uh, what do you call <coughs> in a bad shape in a bad shape so but uh, the new policy is introducing a huge number of innovative and progressive steps but it is uh, not talking about the existing problems that are there already so how are we going to respond to the existing problems that are already in the system <clears throat> now and a, a few other issues will the three language formula work and a lot of people in the non hindi speaking belt are worried about will hindi and sanskrit be imposed okay but uh, that is one question that uh, people have and in learning in mother tongue and home language and uh, the government especially this policy is insisting upon teaching the main subjects in the mother tongue and uh, they say english can be taught as one subject but uh, the main subject should be taught in mother tongue or in home language now uh, they are saying up to fifth standard or to up to eighth standard so then what will happen after the fifth standard or a standard will the children be able to cope with an english medium uh, in media after that so the parents have realized and uh, the teachers have realized that uh, this was a huge problem in india and that is why uh, the english medium schools uh, started for at the kindergarten level and at the pre primary level now going back to the mother tongue on home language uh there are educationists who say that it is actually very good for the children because a lot of concepts develop in your own language you, you know that we cannot express anything or uh, think of even a concept without a language we need uh, a language and we need to be proficient in a language understood and the mother tongue has to be given the due respect but uh, what will happen is uh, this uh, type of uh, insistence on the mother tongue at home language Uh, will be only with the government schools and government sponsored schools uh, we'll have to wait and see if the private schools will opt for this or will the private schools will continue to have their uh, teaching and uh, subjects in english medium and uh, in which case what will happen in uh, when the children reach uh, the 12th standard or enter into the college so those who have been studying in their mother tongue or home language will they be able to compete with the students who have been studying all the time in english so this problem only perpetuates will have to wait and see about the indian evil civilization history so this policy wants to talk about or bring about uh, uh, what do you call knowledge on uh, indian civilization in history and uh, you know that uh, a week ago they even formed a commission of about 15 or 16 members Uh, to talk about the last 20000 years of civilization in india but uh, what happens is as you know uh, all the people belong to just one religious group and all the people belong to one or uh, similar uh, forward caste groups so will the uh, history be of india be interpreted uh, wrongly 
Will it be based on religious bias? Will it be uh, indoctrinated? Uh, so these are questions that people do have about uh, uh, the study of Indian civilization according to these people. And not uh, anyone, but uh, Ramachandra Guha, a famous historian himself, uh, has criticized this very much about leaving the study of history to religious uh, biased people. Okay. And then uh, the policy is silent on very many relevant to social sciences, Dalits, gender, environment, peace, education, human rights. The policy does not talk about any of these issues today. And all these issues are currently very important, even globally, you know. So much of awareness is coming about uh, gender, environment, peace, and uh, classless societies, and acceptance of uh, other students. But then what is happening is none of these find a place in uh, the policy. Because in a country like India, uh, you still certainly need uh, gender studies and environment studies, peace studies, human rights studies. These are very important because so not only the awareness is uh, slowly emerging. All right, the next. <coughs> the talk about a 6% GDP is always there. And as I told you way back in 1968, you know, when Kothari Commission had studied and uh, the new education policy, it was called uh, at the time as NPE, and uh, they talked about six percent of the GDP. Okay, and the government at that time uh, the said the restruct in construction, sorry, the reconstruction of education will need an additional outlay. The aim should be to gradually increase the investment in education so as to reach a level of expenditure of six percent of the national income as early as possible you know that was uh, that was in 1968 and uh, can uh, you know if you take even the last 6 years uh, may 24 uh, 2004 our spent on gdp especially on education has been falling 6 years ago the education expenditure was 3.1 of gdp it fell to 2.8 <coughs> and registered a further drop to 2.4 if you take the average, uh, uh, what you call spending on education in the last six years, it will certainly be just three less than than three percent. Except in the last year, it uh, it uh, spiked up to four point something. But all the time, if you take the average, it will be lesser than three percent. So that is the situation we have here in India. So to talk about six percent of GDP has never happened in the last fifty-two years of, from the first educational. Uh, national education policy. It hasn't happened even once. In the coming year, assessment of the knowledge would be based on a few new factors. One, practical implementation, <coughs> ability of innovation, problem solving using knowledge, and conceptual application of the knowledge. So there will be new trends even in the assessment, and uh, this is what uh, the uh, new policy is saying. It won't be just a rote memory exams but it will be on a very progressive assessment model. And uh, any uh, new type of assessment model is always welcome, and uh, provided it is unbiased, and uh, uh, it is also easily accessible to the poor, to the poor and uh, even the government schools. All right, delivering education is a duty of state government. This is another huge, uh, probably for the John himself would have de dealt on this issue, I'm very sure, because uh, it is a concurrent, uh, <coughs> education is a concurrent uh, one. And uh, what is happening is taking the power away from states that are organized on linguistic grounds to develop and execute appropriate educational policy amounts to weakening their educational mandate. There was a reason because each of the states knows its own people, their culture, ethos, and uh, language, and they were able to do now taking the education and having control at the national level and trying to feed the same polio, this one to everybody across India, notwithstanding the fact that there are so many tribals and so many people in the rural area, people who are not uh, same as uh, those who live in urban uh, settings and uh, with a very few infrastructure. How can you feed this type of a thing to everyone? So there must be a collaboration at the state level. Otherwise, in India, you can never have uh, 
So one type of a thing for everybody, you know that, you know, those of us, because we know we have been to different states, we know different cultures. So it is not like uh, you just can feed the same uh, food to everybody. So uh, there is also a, uh, this one, for example, Poonam Batra, a professor of education at the University of Delhi Central Institute of Education. And she says, NAP 2020 is based on a relatively shallow understanding of the ground realities of education in an unequal society. It does not provide a coherent perspective of the means of providing quality and equitable public education. It blurs the boundaries of core educational values of equality, fraternity and justice, essential to the education of democratic and secular citizens. So it is uh, very uh, strongly worded, strongly worded. And there is a criticism that um, a very, uh, for example, maybe I will uh, say in the coming slides also, the, the word secularism has been really left out of this policy. While the government, uh, so, sorry, while the new policy, uh, education policy talks about constitutional values in more than one place, talking about various types of values, how is it that they are talking about all other values and conveniently leave out the 1976 uh, amended, uh, preamble amended, where the word secularism had been added into the constitution and that has been left out in this policy. I don't think it is uh, just a uh, omission of overlapping, but uh, probably uh, what does the government want to convey by leaving out the word uh, uh, secularism? <clears throat> A segregated education system. This is another huge problem. Many of the, if you have been reading uh, about the national education policy in the papers and in the columns and in articles, one of the things that is being pointed out regularly by all uh, writers and educationists is about the segregation in education system. Okay. Now, informal education measures recommended for uh, special education zones include short-term training courses for teachers, peer tutoring, community-led voluntary efforts to support learners. This proposed institutionalization of segregated education system with poor teaching learning, poor quality teachers, if implemented, could lead to a deep retrogression in Indian education. Why are we saying this? What can happen is, uh, just to imagine, okay, <clears throat> How many of your schools will just take unqualified, untrained teachers and put them there? Will you just take a 12th standard pass boy or a girl uh, with a few months, let us say she or he has a certificate of a six months, some type of a training, and will you allow that person to come and teach your children? So this is what is happening with, uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are not just talking about a uh, few hundred or few thousand, as I told you, there are about 11 plus lakhs of teachers who are already into the system like this. And where are they or whom are they teaching? They are teaching actually the poor children in Anganwadis and in pre-primary schools, the private schools which are uh, running in the rural and other areas with the limited funds. Whom, whom are they uh, employing? They are employing these type of uh, the so-called uh, teachers, the so-called teachers. They are not the poor, really trained teachers, qualified teachers. So now why is this segregation? Why is this happening to the government sponsored and government schools? While the well run private schools can afford good teachers and good uh, qualified teachers. Now we are already finding this segregation of the rich and the poor students. A system of education which is offered to the students in the government schools vary from what is offered at the at the good well well established private schools even the cbse itself for example uh, how many poor children can afford to do cbse uh, so take the cbse uh, study in a cbse schools so what about those children who take up a start, uh, state board exams now many of these children when they come to the higher education level are not able to withstand the competencies of the competition from the uh, students who have studied in well-established private schools. Now, dear uh, fathers, brothers, sisters, and friends, uh, it, it all depends on uh, which side uh, our emphasis is all about. Okay, If uh, 
we are quite content with the well established private schools then uh, we may not worry about what is happening to these poor children in the rural areas and what is happening to those uh, even our own catholic uh, uh, unaided private schools or aided uh, schools in the remote rural areas the suffering that they have the lack of infrastructures they don't have labs like you they don't have uh, libraries like you they don't have smart classes like you they are they don't have qualified teachers like you so why is this segregation happening again and again and more and more you know so this is a question that we need to ask ourselves and this nep is not talking about this problem it is not even mentioning about the that this problem is existing and this is very sad you know that is what the many education is are feeling why are we not talking about the segregation in education system <clears throat> and uh, perpetuating inequality on close scrutiny the policy does little to address specific well known endemic problems that plague india's education system the proposed interventions appear well meaning but they are based on shallow understanding on the ground realities of education where the divide between the rich and the poor forward caste and backward caste elite private schools and poor government schools are very high and they could suffer deep infirmities in execution now this inequality what would happen is the opportunity is that this uh, the so called uh, what do you call uh, very poorly educated student has in the society with regard to the jobs with regard to for further studies higher education they are all very much limited to this type of people so what can happen is uh, there will be always inequality in the inequality and who are these people who are often sidelined who are marginalized who are out of this uh, school system they are actually the poor they come from the slums they come from the uh, rural area they come from villages they come from tribal area belt and these are the people who are again and again left behind how can the society be equal uh, when we when we have a huge number of people left behind this way <clears throat> what about the free education okay is the right to education had in the past had laid down legal underpinnings for achieving universal elementary education and they also had brought in uh, free education you know from the age of 6 to 14 but this uh, new policy does not talk about free education he talks about equitable and quality education from the foundational stage but he does not state what is this suitable facilitating system could be so will they offer pre, uh, free education or will they uh, will they continue to live it as in the past as in the past to the hands of the private uh, school owners so what can happen is knowing that the government schools does not government school does not uh, offer or impart good education even ordinary parents who are in the lower middle class are forced to send their children to private schools will this continue so the problem that uh, i'm sure uh, father must have already dealt with the right to education is it has been is it been done away with okay so this is one question that we need to ask ourselves okay we have to ask ourselves if uh, because right to education is a very very important act it had been but it is not ex been extended in this new policy it has not been extended in this policy and there is no mention about it so probably they are doing away with the right to education act once and for all and then the, probably bringing in uh, this what they call the equitable uh, equal quality and equity in education okay. now is nep a far fetched uh, idea okay now the new nep intends to integrate uh, the new indian education system with global patterns do away with rote learning and things like that and bring in also vocationalization okay when this is there a broad direction NEP uh, says it is only uh, providing a broad direction, and uh, probably it is not mandatory to follow, since education is a concurrent subject. Both centre and state governments can make laws on it. So when uh, questions were uh, asked to the Ministry of Education, uh, they were always uh, you know little evasive about it. You know these are things that the state governments have to establish, and they say you know we will not be able to say anything. We will uh, wait and see. Uh, whether uh, 
uh, this will continue or not, you know. So probably we won't be insisting on this for uh, some more years, you know, things like that. The very fact that the incumbent government has set a target of 2040 to implement the entire policy. OK, so that is quite a, quite a long period, quite a long period. And uh, a lot of things can change by then, you know, the mindset. We, uh, we know that in the past 10 years itself with the technology and all that, the education field has uh, changed so much. And we are talking about 2040 as the final uh, time for uh, implementing the entire policy. So, so many things can also change in between. Talking about uh, two or three things about higher education. So there is a huge uh, problem today about uh, higher education becomes becoming elusive to the poor and to the marginalized. So there is a lot of criticism about the new policy on centralization, commercialization, and communalization. Centralization, as you know, as I told you, there is an umbrella uh, authority, Higher Education Commission, and there are four uh, bodies under that. So will they be uh, making too much of centralization of all the colleges that they come in India? Uh, so will the states have nothing to do with the colleges in, in their own state? So with the, so many bodies at the central uh, government level, so will all colleges be centralized? Commercialization, yes, you know that they are planning to bring 100 foreign universities to India. And uh, they are also wanting to have private uh, public private partnership, which means corporates can come in, you know, in the name of bringing Harvard University or Stanford University or uh, Oxford University uh, branch in India. And they can have huge college campuses with uh, uh, exactly typical foreign university campuses like within India. And this could be who will uh, have access to this. So the creamy layer of the society and the affordable and affluent society people can have access to this. And more and more education will be commercialized. The fee structure will change drastically. And uh, in order to compete with them, the other private colleges and other colleges too have to raise the standard and the whole, then it becomes slowly unaffordable to the poor and the rural people. And the third thing about communalization is they are talking about, uh, for example, uh, the uh, different exit points and also the entrance exams for every stream. Uh, earlier they had a neat exam and uh, thing like that for professional courses. But now they are planning to have for arts and science and for every stream there will be an entrance exam. And you know, if you don't pass the entrance exam, many people may give up studying, uh, doing higher education. And uh, the government, uh, this policy also gives option at the end of every year. If you complete the first year, you can get a, a certificate. If you want to leave at the end of second year, you can go with a diploma. And if you want to leave at the end of third year, then you get a degree, you know. So multi exit point and also things like that. So what would uh, what people are reading in between us? Only those people who are of the creamy layer, huh? they can afford to do higher education. They will be the, the top layer people who can clear IAS exams and who can hold high posts in the country, in the government and the whole very prestigious portfolios in the country. So who, who will do this? I leave it to your imagination. And uh, you know who cannot have access to this? Probably you already know. So this is this is another one. Then, for example, concerns that the NEP 2020 poses for the charge. Uh, the coming slides, about five, six of them, will be a, a sort of, um, how do I say, um, putting together whatever has been discussed till now. A few points for you to keep in mind. Okay, I'll just read through very fast, and probably you know about these things earlier. We have mentioned also in the previous slides, but just to uh, recap. An important policy like the national education policy needs to be approved by the parliament. It's a very important point and they have just uh, skipped it. They have just skipped it and it is not correct. We need to point that out every time. The word secularism has been left out and that is also uh, unacceptable. It also blurs the boundaries of core constitutional values and by uh, so leaving out, they are not talking about constitutional rights in this policy. 
they are only talking about constitutional values and constitutional duties. But what about the constitutional rights? Yeah, from 1968, I told you about the 6% expenditure and uh, for, for the past 52 years, okay, nothing has been done. The new NEP 2020 also says the same thing that they will strive to spend 6% of the GDP. When uh, the this type of a money, even 6%, is not spent on education, how do you expect uh, the students in India to become, uh, uh, the education in India to improve, okay? We must also realize that uh, the Delhi government, for example, I just would like to put it on record, that uh, the last year's uh, um, the spending of Delhi government on education was over 24%. And on average, they have been spending more than 20% of the GDP of the state government on education. Today, the public schools of the government schools of uh, Delhi are far better than many of the private schools run in Delhi. Private schools run in Delhi. And uh, as uh, Abhijit Banerjee, the Nobel laureate, had uh, mentioned, the Delhi public schools are the government schools. There are many private schools which call themselves public schools, which is not correct and which is not true, because public schools are supposed to be the government schools. And uh, Delhi schools are a shining examples of how a government school be, can, can be run, you know, with uh, all the facilities that they provide. And uh, you only need to visit any of their schools to understand how well they are run. So it is not impossible for a government to spend 6%, uh, while a state government, which also has got so many other expenses, can spend over 20 to 24% of their GDP. Now, segregation of the poor, we talked about it um, in more than two slides, and I also explained that uh, that uh, what is going to happen, uh, you will have to understand is that the segregation of the poor and affluent class of students will play into the hands of the new liberal economy to make majority of the students into low income employees. The policy does not even acknowledge this. So this is why we will be uh, this education, new education policy, will it be a feeder system to the, the rich companies and factories to provide low level, low income employees. <clears throat> the overall focus is on technology, a welcoming thing, but it will leave a large number of students left behind as they do not have access to resources in both rural and urban areas. You know that even uh, to this day, there are many schools and uh, many areas in which online classes are not taking place because the children cannot afford to have any device that uh, the urban students and uh, the secondary uh, town uh, students have. The cost of education in general would be a rise and thus education can become unaffordable to the rural poor. Introduction of multidisciplinary courses requires infrastructure and finances. So it is one thing to talk about multidisciplinary courses. Then what about multidisciplinary faculty then? Uh, to, uh, you, you, uh, is it enough to have a teacher today only specialized in max or in zoology or in botany or should we have a teacher who is also qualified in multidiscipline exams for classes three five and eight will give mental pressure to students and uh, will it lead to school dropouts these are questions people are asking huh? but at the same time uh, nobody is against uh, uh, some type of assessment in order to understand if the children have learned uh, numbers or to read you know this is also very important in india that the children can come to fifth standard and not able to cope within second standard uh, uh, portion. But at the same time, uh, what will happen? What will happen at the end of these uh, assessment? So will the children uh, choose drop? Because you know that in India, every time there is a public examination, there is always a lot of dropout. So will uh, these uh, exams or these uh, as a graded assessment lead to more and more dropouts? And then, Will the infrastructure of the school be infected? This is one question that many people have. The limited autonomous we had on this decision making on the institution be there still, minority institutions. So why am I saying? Because uh, the, uh, the government or the design slowly will, will start using our complexes. 
and you know that uh, they are also creating a school complexes. The school complexes will be like a cluster of schools in which those schools who cannot afford to have Anganwadi, they do not have either a premise or a playground or thing like that, will have, will have the access of uh, the bigger school. And in the bigger school, if for example, if our own school has got a, a vast campus and uh, all these facilities, then probably we need to include more and more schools in the local area children to come into our schools to use our uh, system, sorry, to use our premises and resources. There is no acknowledgement on the contribution of private schools, which includes many unaided Catholic education institutions. For example, this policy does not even talk about, uh, even in one place, about the contribution that the Christians have made to education system in India. You know, we were pioneers in higher education in India, and uh, we know the government certainly knows that uh, the Christian institutions have brought in a huge standard as well as uh, a paradigm shift in the education of India, but uh, there is not even a passing mention about it, and it is sad, but then it is okay. We are not uh, expecting them to be uh, acknowledging all these things, but it would have been very nice. It would have been very nice when uh, the country is progressing this way to make a certain mention about the pioneers. The policy is silent on issues relevant to caste, as I told you already. It's not just mentioning and is omitting quite a few things which are very important in the global level today. There is so much a study going on gender issues, my uh, climate change and other things. Then why is this uh, new policy not showing any interest on this? It does not address the ratio of teachers to students. And uh, in the for abroad, uh, the success of the schools have been because of the ratio of uh, teacher student. But here in India, you know that already our classes are filled with so many students. And the teacher hardly has a time to cope with uh, correction of papers or teaching a huge number of students in each class. So how will it ensure quality, quality in education? All right. The instead of bringing about a systemic change, uh, people are afraid that the new NEP 2020 will worsen the existing education challenges and may cause irreversible damage to our future generation. What if a majority of our new generation students end up as uh, dropouts or choose to get into work at a very early age and remain thus for the rest of their lives. So that is uh, one uh, uh, big worry that uh, we uh, we have. The right wing agenda in content and in appointment of implementation committees is worrying and uh, uh, will will the education be biased on religious basis in, in the instantly or uh, incidentally the higher uh, commission of uh, higher education commission of india you know uh, the umbrella body of higher education is headed by the prime minister himself now to have a political head into this education system as a head is not uh, something uh, uh, good because in the future we know that uh, the political coloring as well as their agenda will also can come into the education system that is why education system was always kept away from the political people and uh, was always uh, held by the bureaucracy. But uh, bringing in political people, will it uh, do good or will it do uh, damage? The word minority and minority rights do not appear anywhere in the policy. So it is a constitution provision. And will this uh, policy omit it or will it continue to recognize it? So these are the questions that we have when the, for the future. When they speak about training of qualified teachers, no mention is made up of uh, 1.1 million teachers who are already in the system. I told you about this. Danger to the federal system of India as education is being taken out of state involvement and decision making and bringing education under the control of the center. Will Catholic institutions be controlled and our campus taken over by government by the so-called cluster of schools concept and making available all our resources and infrastructure for students from other schools? Over privatization of education leading to high fees from the students and low salary to teachers. So this is also what we see in many places in India. Deprivation of basic amenities to government rules and colleges. Multiple doors open for hidden agendas. Focus on local language, but uh, will private schools follow this or is it only for government run or aided schools creating uneven playing field at the higher education level? 
centralization, commercialization. I told you about this in new education is also a thing. Can our Catholic educators be part of the committees which will implement the NEP 2020 at the national and state level? So these are things which we need to try and uh, wherever the governments are sympathetic, I think our uh, not only uh, Catholic, but also good uh, educators who are open minded, who are not biased, should enter into these committees in order to bring about a change. And uh, the governments, the existing para teachers and guest teachers, you know, and uh, uh, what they call Shikshak uh, Mitra in government run schools, Anganwadi centers, and in private schools who often are unqualified and untrained, continue teaching the children from poor background. So, will they be replaced with the qualified teachers? I don't think so because they are paid very low in a sum. And many governments say that they do not have the money to pay. And uh, you know, when these uh, teachers went to the Supreme Court asking for a better payment or uh, on equal footing with the other teachers, the Supreme Court uh, said, no, I, we cannot uh, entertain this claim. You go back to your uh, state governments and talk to them. And uh, interestingly, the Bihar government, uh, let us say, for example, where, uh, they have uh, they have only uh, let us say about 10 10 15 percent of the teachers as qualified and all others are uh, unqualified teachers and they wouldn't like to pay a big salary to them so this is a situation that is in one state and i don't know i don't have the statistics of all the states as about will they continue uh, uh, replacing or will they continue with this para teachers and guest teachers Will the appointment of trained volunteers from both the local community and beyond social workers, counselors, and community involvement? So this policy is uh, talking about bringing in trained volunteers from the local community, people who can come as counselors, people who can come and do social work, people who can come and, uh, you know, there is a lot of ambiguity about it. Who are these uh, trained volunteers? Who are these people? Are they coming in disguise? Or uh, what will they come and teach? What will be the agenda? So, uh, will will they be professional or will they be just volunteers? And uh, so, this is a question. So, are we supposed to really take them or is it just uh, meant for some schools? We don't know. Will there be consolidation of schools? That's also another problem. If, uh, for example, uh, uh, many of these uh, rural remote uh, schools, if they do not have a certain number, are they going to close all those schools? For example, those of us who have traveled to the Northeast and in many other places, you know that uh, each of these villages are far from uh, each other and uh, the girl children especially cannot afford to go to a faraway place for a class, school and come back every day safe. So that is why the Catholic Church had established many hundreds of, let us say, village schools. In, uh, For example, in some of our parishes, there are more than 100 schools. Because in 100 villages, they have set up schools. Why? Because it is to help young people to be educated. Now, if they're going to close all these schools, where will these children go? We have to understand that situation too, you know. So, will the management be handed over to the school complex management committee? So, that is another problem. So, what will happen to our registered societies? Should our dioceses and congregations be prepared to implement this policy and make a get ready list? You know, this is also thought that many people are advocating that uh, this policy cannot be uh, revoked and it is better to go along with the policy. Uh, and while we are making our voices known to the government, it is also good to start implementing this policy. So what can we do is each diocese can get ready already a get ready list so that we will be uh, ready early to withstand the probable obstacles. How do we pledge? to educate the poor and marginalized in spite of the policy creating more segregation and more privatization is for each of the bishops as well as the educators and the principals and the corporate managers, all of us to sit together and to see how we can continue to offer education to the poor. Well, in paving the way for enhanced privatization of the school system and abrogating the rights of India's linguistic states to define educational policy and priorities, NEP 2020 could potentially betray the constitutional vision of education for equity and social justice. <clears throat> Let us do some introspection. Are you comfortable with the NEP 2020? So this is a question that uh, you will have to answer for yourself. You can also write in the chat box if you like. 
And uh, for example, uh, the problem many of us are asking is, will we be excluded? Is my institution relevant and will it survive with the NAP 2020? Uh, with all the provisions that it is asking and uh, so many demands that it is making. Will my, if you are running an institution in the semi-rural area or in rural area or in village, uh, will you be able to survive? This is one of the questions. Will poor be excluded? This is another question that uh, we have the duty to ask because the church's uh, mission and service is basically and uh, predominantly meant for the poor. And will uh, NEP 2020 exclude the poor and disadvantaged, particularly in rural areas? And the next question that we need to ask ourselves is, will NEP 2020 be better? Will it, will it offer better education? Because contrary to all other beliefs that it can do things like that, uh, probably there are others who believe that it can offer better education. Okay. Now, what can be our responses? So I would like you to talk about these uh, six responses. Okay. People are saying, let us be proactive. Let us not simply sit idle and say, criticize this policy and say, well, this policy is not going to take me anywhere. So what I do, I think it is time to start uh, being proactive. So participate in the process, participate in the dissemination, advocacy and consensus. Take uh, first to read the uh, policy well and see how it can be made applicable and what my, my institution or my diocese should do about this. Then second thing is perform astutely, perform with well-defined goals, concrete measures, available resources, regular evaluation. Partner with other people, NGOs, industries, corporates, and other education institutions. Do not be only looking into yourself, but rather look at uh, the possibilities where my student can learn. Uh, the other day also one of the fathers was saying that how we brought uh, cardiovascular doctors and other people from industry to talk to the students and also to take the students to the nearby industries or nearby farms and nearby uh, articulture or animal farms. You know, the children learn a lot of things. We need to partner with the NGOs and others. Plan strategies. We are intelligent people and we can plan strategies and actions to guarantee the vision and mission of our institution and the people. We don't have to give up the vision of our institution and we don't have to be, uh, you know, what uh, say, oh, this new policy has changed everything. I'm not able to do anything. No, uh, we need to be good strategies in order to plan ahead, in order to keep this. Prepare the stakeholders. We need to talk to the teachers, administrators, parents, and everyone, including the student, to know about the new nuances, gain competency, respond appropriately, and propose reforms. Proposing changes to the policies, procedures, and monitoring control mechanisms level, including the state level, national level, at the district level. So we need to be people proactively. I would like to offer these six uh, uh, what do you call points for us to be proactive in the coming months. What should be our concern today as Catholic institutions? They are an outcome focus undoubtedly critical, but should be underpinned by an overarching uh, human qualities. We, have, we always had the holistic uh, in mind. We must try to offer oh, oh, our yeah. Uh, huh? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, Father. Oh, yes, continue. Somebody. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I, yes. I got this. So we must strive to offer as per our Catholic tradition, holistic education. We must not just stop. Okay, we continue to teach children that schooling is uh, isn't just an end for them, but a ladder to opportunities. We shall continue our mission of educating the tribal and Dalit communities and the marginalized in spite of the government regulations. We need to do that. And uh, what are the outcomes we want schooling to generate? And are they adequate to produce the qualities for individuals to contribute meaningfully to the society and economy? So we would like to have continue to have the quality education as a hallmark of the Catholic institutions. So we must not deter from this. We must continue. So transitioning to a system that expands the idea of outcomes from literacy and numeracy to a breadth of skills. That is what the new policy is uh, talking about. Every student to go out with a skill. The largest set of skills that are needed in a changing world, including critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, interpersonal uh, relationships, you know, all these things are needed today and we need to train our students into these things. 
And uh, what while we follow the NEP 2020, we must at the very instance a transitional change in our institution is a much. <coughs> I'm sorry. Catholic institutions should adapt the genuine vision that education is the ministry of sharing God's love and not a means of drawing revenue as in the case of a large number of today's institutions. The fee we collect should justify the facilities provided for the whole round in development of the students. The practices of capitation fee and the mandatory donations for admissions and the appointment of faculty must be abolished immediately. I'm sure none of us do this, but if anybody is still doing this, I think we must stop this type of bad practices. Pay the salary as per government norms. Provide qualitative facilities to the underprivileged and marginalized, especially in rural areas, with the annual surplus income from the urban institutions. So these are, I don't know if this will be allowed in the future, but at the same time, we need to continue to care for the poor. And to conclude, a new education policy coined with the modern technological advancement is a demand of the time. There is no doubt about it. It's already over, long overdue. And this is future oriented, rooted in Indian traditions, values and cultures in the context of the global educational advancement and practices, as it claims. We also realize that it can hurt the poor and the marginalized. We must continue to be the voice of the poor and at their service. We must pledge to educate the poor. There will be lots of challenges in the days to come, but we are the disciples of Christ who continued with his stand for justice, truth and mercy, despite all difficulties. And let's not be afraid, but always try to do what is good. So thank you very much. Huh? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Father, for your perspicacity. The colorful slides were very captivating. Now we can take up some questions from the audience. Yes, you can raise your hands to ask the questions. We can take up a few of them. Any questions? OK, so now I invite. Um, yeah. hey. Yes, okay. there are no questions in the chat box. So I invite Minu to propose a vote of thanks to Father Maria Charles. Minu. Thank you, Reverend Father, Reverend for giving us. Asked by Deviga Yadav. Yes, Father. Some there is question. a question from Deviga Yadav. Yeah, please. Yes. please. Yeah, Deepika, ma'am, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question to Father. This is Sunita Yadav, uh, Father. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, just one question. Uh, how much, how long is it going to take to implement this new economic uh, this new education policy like the uh, students they keep asking ma'am uh, like those who are in uh, 12th standard ma'am will it be implemented this year or when will it be implemented so like no uh, by 23 they are saying but will it be possible like the considerations and the concerns that we are facing or will be facing so will it be possible to implement it by 23? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for asking question, Deepika. Uh -huh. So the government itself is uh, spaced out and they are talking about bringing quite a few of these changes only by 2030. And they want to, uh, what I call, implement the entire policy uh, by only 2040. Okay. Now they have begun the national curriculum framework the first timeline which is given for these two years. OK, they have just begun it. And if you like to join in into that process, uh, you could ask in the local uh, this one, uh, district uh, education officers and others if there is a possibility of sending your suggestions to NCRT still. OK, they had given the last week of August just one week for the teachers to answer or respond about 102 questions, isn't it? I don't know if you have responded to them at that time. But if you haven't responded, you can still probably send uh, your response and they may even take it up in case you like to propose something. 
But that there is were so one many questions. There yes, were so many questions. Yes, yes, I know. Like in one particular theme, there were about uh, 10 to 20 questions. I know. And I more know, than I know, that. I know. Yeah. I know, I know. So that is why it was difficult. But uh, given the fact that we are just through the COVID-19 period and most of the states do not have any funds left, you know, even if the government wishes to, and the central government also is uh, not able to uh, do many of the payments to the state governments when it comes to GST and other things. So everybody is uh, bankrupt or uh, they are uh, they don't have funds. They have uh, their wells all gone dry. So it will take uh, quite a few years before this uh, policy begins. And uh, many of them would be just uh, non-starters, in my opinion, in my opinion. There'll be many of them non-starters because the policy, uh, some of them are very progressive. But you know that by the time you establish a mechanism in order to implement, it can take years, it can take years. So mm -hmm. probably it won't be a just overnight change like that. But uh, all said and done, uh, it is good to read through the policy and get our institutions slowly ready already, you know, ready already with the uh, facilities as well as the qualification of teachers and keeping a high standard in our schools. Thank you, ma'am. Ma no. thank, thank you, Father. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father. So, any other question? Anybody wants to ask? Excuse me, ma'am. I'm not Deepika Yadav. Sunita Yadav. It's okay, Sunita okay, Yadav. Okay, okay. I, I'll get your name changed, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> it was thank you. up as Deepika Yadav, so okay. I like that. Okay. Okay. Sorry, thank, you, okay, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? Can we can take some more questions if you have? Okay, uh, so now I invite Minu to propose a vote of thanks to Father Maria Charles. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Reverend Father, for yes. giving us a deep insight into NEP 2020. The PowerPoint presentation which you displayed was very well framed as well as very colorful. You touched upon all the major areas of NEP, highlighting the major recommendations of NEP, the pros and gaps, the challenges and concerns that NEP 2020 poses for our church. In my opinion, some of the changes will unanimously be accepted, while some will have problems being implemented and I'm sure every one of us is ready to take up the challenge. Thank you, Father, once again. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and knowledge on the topic. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Father. So, so on my behalf, I would like to thank also the, uh, your grace, as well as Father Thomas, who had invited me for this uh, session, and to all the, and to, to you, Ms. Priyanka, for introducing me, and to all the teachers, uh, the principals and managers and everyone for patiently listening. OK, so thank you very much. There is a question from Prema Gautam about will there be any training for the teachers who are already in profession? Uh, this will be an online uh, ongoing formation. I'm sure every diocese will take up to this type of a training of, of again and again. And I'm sure based on the new National Education Policy 2020, the teachers have to be trained more and more. So we are not talking about the BA courses reconstructed. But there will be an ongoing uh, training on this uh, for the qualification of teachers more and more. Certainly. Okay, then. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, thank you. Charles, thank you thank very you, much. You, your, your exposition was really uh, appreciative and very, very vivid. And we loved it. And your critic was more interesting. We cannot afford to give up. We need yes, to stand yes. strong. And we need to be alert. Thank you so much. We will keep our eyes open and ears open. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks to everyone. Thank Thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone.